Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. For today's episode, I will be looking at Early Greek Philosophy by John Burnett. And this book is nice and old school, the way I like them. Written back in, originally written, uh, back in 1892, the first edition. This is the fourth edition, the one that I'm reading from, the fourth edition was written in 1930, so a good 30, whew, 38 years later. Uh, this was published in 65, but it's the fourth edition from 1930 that I'm reading. So, well back into originally written in the, in the 19th century. Uh, there have been some new ideas in early Greek philosophy and the study of Greek philosophy since then. This kind of has some things, has some, this book has some things about it that are definitely dated. Um, probably the most dated thing about it and the part of it that, you know, gets on my nerves the most is the, are the translations. He's translating, uh, ancient Greek philosophers, uh, before Socrates, the pre-Socratics, if you will. And, uh, the translations, sometimes he drops in these, like, the, thy, thou, uh, trying to give it a sort of archaic, you know, I mean, this, this is not written in the in the in the you know 1500s it's written in 1892 there's no reason to be dropping the thy thou in the translations so there's actually like a section i want to read of one of the works of one of the pre-socratics parmenides and i'm actually going to jump to another book to read the translation because I think it sounds more modern. It's a more modern translation. But the interpretation of Parmenides, I'm reading from this book. But this is actually going to be a little bit different than my other episodes in that uh, I'm reading from another book for the, for the translations, but I'm also going to be dipping into Plato for a moment because there's a section of Plato that I want to look at in relation to this. Because what I'm really talking about in this episode and what the part of this book I want to look at is Parmenides um, and the goddess Ananke and how they relate to one another. The last couple episodes, uh, we've talked about, well, we back in, in Nietzsche's book a few episodes back, we talked about Anaximander, Heraclitus, and Parmenides, and we've been spent a few episodes now looking at these three and early Greek philosophy. Last episode, we dived into Heraclitus. We looked at Anaximander a little bit with in Heidegger's book, and in this episode and in this book, I want to zero in on Parmenides. This author talks about Heraclitus and Anaximander and other philosophers, um, but I don't want to get into all of them. I want to focus on Parmenides and some ideas I have about Parmenides and, and what Parmenides' uh, mission was, what he was trying to accomplish. And I guess I disagree with this author about the, this topic, about what Parmenides was trying to do. But maybe I sort of disagree with him and, and probably a lot of other thinkers about the pre-Socratics in general and what they were doing. So... I've made one observation. I don't know if I've talked about it in this podcast. I'm, I may have mentioned this before, but it's just an observation I've made, which is that if you talk to uh, a teacher, let's say, about what you know the most important aspects of society are, it's probably more likely, let's say, that the teacher is going to tell you how important education is. And the doctor is going to tell you how important healthcare is to a functioning civilization and so on. Um, the general will tell you how important national def defense is to a healthy civilization. People tend to really value their, their own roles. And maybe they value that role and that's why they got into that field. Or maybe they got into the field and... That's why they value it, because it serves their ego. Maybe a combination of the two. But the same goes for philosophers. Philosophers will postulate that 
philosophy is like the noblest endeavor. Surprise, surprise. Um, scientists will go on and on about the importance of science. Everybody overestimates their own uh, ideas and the importance of them. And people also will look and see what they want to see when they're like looking at these old philosophers. I think that the modern philosopher, the modern thinker, especially the modern academic, I mean, I guess this com this comes back like to academics. An academic or a, a professor will tell you how important, you know, the university is and things like that. Um, my point is that the, the modern thinker really uh, holds reason in high regard. Well, first of all, the modern thinker holds thinking in high regard. And the modern thinker is going to hold thought up as the noblest endeavor. But that shouldn't surprise us. And should we necessarily listen and say, well, thought, true, the pursuit of truth, really is the noblest endeavor, just because somebody who thinks for a living comes to that conclusion? I think that we, the modern scholar looks back to the ancient Greek philosophers and looks to them as sort of like the founders of science and reason and uh, will interpret from them a lot of uh, the birth of rationality sort of mindset, the birth of science and rational thought, stepping, they, they were stepping away from their... Um, their mythology. They were stepping away from their uh, the religion of their society, the established religious norms of their society, and they were, you know, boldly speaking truth to power and bringing the light of rationality into the world. You know, and that's what makes these pre-Socratic philosophers so great. But you could probably imagine that's the kind of story you're going to get from a modern post-enlightenment university professor who's bound to the value and importance of reason and rationality. That's, you know, the, that's like their job, you know, explorers of reason. In the last book we looked at, Heraclitus, we, we t I talked about how um, Deals, I believe, was the, was the, the name of the guy who this, you know, Philip Wheelwright, the author of the last book, had said, had, had really misinterpreted Heraclitus. And kind of, they kind of see what they want to see. You know, if they're, if they're universalists, they see universalism, the birth of universalism. They see what they want to see in these guys. And they don't always get it right. Sometimes they're wrong. And sometimes they can dispute with each other about it. But none of them really, you know, have this claim to the absolute be the absolute authority on how to interpret these guys. Uh, they always see what they what they want to see in them, and they dis they dispute with each other sometimes, like fundamental aspects uh, about what these guys are saying. And so, I'm just going to take it upon myself to dispute what this guy is saying about this. I think he's looking into this, and he's finding this sort of like birth of science type of approach. So let me just jump in here and start reading. Now, this is the from the preface to the third edition. He adds a new, in the third edition, they added a new preface. And I want to read a bit uh, from that. He kind of, the, the reason why is that he's kind of describing what he was attempting to do when he wrote the book. So we can read that and, and get an idea of the, the bird's eye view he takes and his main thesis in the book. He says, quote, My aim has been to show that a new thing came into the world with the early Ionian teachers, the thing we call science, and that they first pointed the way which Europe has followed ever since, so that, as I have said elsewhere, it is an adequate description of science to say that it is thinking about the world in the Greek way. That is why science has never existed except among peoples who have come under the influence of Greece. 
when the first edition of early Greek philosophy was published. 28 years ago, the subject was still generally treated in this country from a Hegelian point of view, and many of my conclusions were regarded as paradoxes. Some of these are now accepted by most people, but there are still two which provoke opposition. In the first place, I ventured to call Parmenides the father of materialism, and it is still maintained in some quarters that he was an idealist, a modern term which is most misleading when applied to Greek philosophy on the ground that the very essence of materialism is that this material world, this world of sense, is the real world, and that Parmenides certainly denied all reality to the world of sense. Undoubtedly he did, and if I used the term materialism in the sense alleged, I should have been talking nonsense. As I understand it, however, the matter of the materialist is not a possible object of sense at all, it is as much or more an ens rationis as spirit and the being of Parmenides is the first clear attempt to apprehend this non-sensuous reality. That is, in fact, the main thesis of my book, and the vital point of the argument is my insistence on the derivation of atomism, which is admittedly materialistic, from eleaticism in accordance with the express statements of Aristotle and Theophrastus. If that is wrong, my whole treatment of the subject is wrong. The other paradox, which has still to win acceptance, is my contention that the opposite view, which finds reality not in matter, but in form, the Platonist view, in short, goes back to the Pythagoreans and was already familiar to Socrates, though it was not formulated in a perfectly clear way to the days of the Platonic Academy. I am convinced that this can only be made good by a fresh interpretation in detail of the Platonic Dialogues, and I am now engaged on that task. End quote. Okay, so basically he says, first of all, a new thing came into the world with the early Ionian teachers, and that was science. Now, there's some validity to this. I'm not really arguing the point that there's a, there was a, uh, a move toward a different type of study of nature with the early Greek philosophers, and they were asking what is matter, what is the world made of, what, is, what are things, what is this stuff around us really made of. And we, when we get talking about the four elements, earth, water, um, air, and, and fire, and uh, you know, we get Thales talking about everything being made out of water, um, what is the prime su primary substance of things, and they're not going necessarily directly to mythological explanations for this stuff. They're beginning to ask what it is on its own um, and the, the way the world works without automatically going to the gods for explanation. So there's some truth to that. But it gets blown out of proportion. And any sort of mythological or religious content in the pre-Socratic philosophers is just brushed, sort of brushed aside as being tangential to their project, or maybe even used ironically, or um, you know, used as a method of of attracting the attention of the listener, getting you know, getting people to want to pay attention to what they're saying, or something like that. There, it's not, it's never really core to anything that the pre-Socratics are saying. And I think that goes too far. These pre-Socratics come from a world that is you know, deeply mythological. They, there's a religious worldview, and the gods and uh, sort of divine forces in the world come into the topics and writings and ideas of the pre-Socratic philosophers all the time, and should be regarded uh, as... A legitimate component of what they're saying. They're not all just making this clean, hard break from mythology that the modern scholar might like to imagine. Now, he talks about Parmenides here. Let me just look back at what he says. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get too much into this particular point, but he's talking about how he's calling Parmenides the father of materialism. Uh, that's kind of... Um, so, Par so Parmenides is like, you know, he's the, he's the guy, as I've talked about in previous episodes, he's the guy who's like, you know, that all change and fluctuation in the world is really just, uh, illusion and 
that which is, is, it can't change, it can't, you know, because, it, you know, I don't want to get into the real details of his philosophy right now, but the, suffice to say, he sort of presents the world as illusion. And in, in that way, he's described as a bit of an idealist, that there's an ideal vision of, of some sort of concept that has a greater reality than the tangible world. And because the concept has a greater reality than the things that you see and do and the process of time and change have a lesser reality, uh, in, that, in that sense, he's called an idealist. And this author says, well, actually, he's, he's not. He's more of a materialist. And uh, he's trying to get at a, a deeper, what he's trying to get at is a deeper matter, the de a deeper concept of what matter is that, that acknowledges that matter as such is sort of a step beyond uh, the world of sensation. I don't, I, I can see where he's coming from. I think that, so what I think is that Parmenides is, uh, he's talking about seeing the world from a different perspective. I'm going to read a bit of Parmenides, the fragments of Parmenides, but he's talking about seeing the world from a different perspective, but I think it is, a, it is a materialist perspective. I think what it is is a deterministic perspective. Parmenides sees things in a, he, he imagines things, let us say, in a, in a very strictly deterministic way and says, what does the world mean? What is the world? What is reality? If a strict determinism carries the day. And so, yes, that's materialistic. And it's also, in a way, sort of transcendent. Transcendent of the human experience. Um, but I'll get more into that in a moment. I want to jump to another section here. Just a very brief little quote here. Uh, he says... The systems we have, he says, quote, the systems we have been studying were all fundamentally pluralist. He's talking about a number of the philosophers. He's, and they were so because Parmenides had shown that if we take a corporeal monism seriously, we must describe to reality a number of predicates inconsistent with our experience of a world which everywhere displays multiplicity, motion, and change. The four roots of Empedocles and the innumerable seeds of Anaxagoras were both of them conscious attempts to solve the problem Parmenides had raised. End quote. So it's a brief little section there, but what he's what he's saying is his thesis essentially is that Parmenides describes cor this corporeal monism. What, what he means by that is corporeal, meaning meaning material, physical, a physical material monism. What is that? Well, we kind of talked about how Parmenides is a monist and Heraclitus is a pluralist. And Parmenides is like, you know, there is really only one thing, that which is. Uh, and if that which is, is matter, and it's only, it's one thing, then the, the many things you see aren't really the true description of what is. It's all just one thing. And he draws all these conclusions from this corporeal monism about how it never changes, it never moves. And he even says it's like spherical, or it's like a sphere. And what the author, John Burnett, is essentially saying in this book is that the corporeal monism proposed by Parmenides is so absurd followed to its logical conclusions that all of the philosophers that came after Parmenides had to either abandon the corporeal aspect or abandon the monism because the corporeal monism itself was untenable. And so what they wound up abandoning was the monism and they moved into atomism. So there's many things and each of these things, these atoms, <laughs> 
adheres to the qualities that Parmenides describes of that which is, in some, in some sense. I mean, obviously, there's still atoms moving, so I don't think, you know, but they're, they're kind of trying to figure out how to incorporate the ideas of Parmenides into their examination of reality, okay? That's the, that's the thesis. But there's a problem here that I see that's glaring, and that is that he's saying that Parmenides is proposing an absurdity. He's, fought, he's taking this concept and laying it out ad absurdium, if you will. But Parmenides is, isn't... So what, what would that mean? Would, it would, is Parmenides consciously saying, here, let me present to you an absurd vision of the world in order to discredit the premises upon which he's building it? Or does he really believe that the world is that way? And everybody else said, well, I mean, they're essentially saying, well, Parmenides is a fool for saying that. None of us are willing to say that. Is that, is that what the author is saying, that Parmenides is, is a fool for presenting this sort of absurd vision? Or is, is Parmenides, because Parmenides doesn't claim that, hey, here's, a, here, here's what it would look like if you were to do that. You know, look, ha ha, look at how crazy that is. No, Parmenides says, here's the truth. There is what is, and there is what isn't. And what isn't can't exist. And what is must exist. What is, is. And what is not, is not. So Parmenides says there's two paths. He says there's the path of what is, and the path of what is not. He says, you can't take a single step on the path of what is not. You can't know anything about the path of what is not. You can only ever know and walk upon the path of what is. And he makes other statements about what is, and I'm not going to get into, you know, all of detail about, you know, all the things that Parmenides ascribes to what is, but it's really just kind of a oneness. Like, that's why Parmenides is considered a monist. It's, it's like, what is, is one. And so, therefore, the multiplicity of things is an illusion. And so Parmenides kind of says, he says, after he says there's two paths, what is and what is not, then he says, okay, well, there's a third path also, actually. And that's like what uh, the, the, the path of mortal thought. And he says essentially, so this is an illusion. This, this, is, this stuff is not true, but it's what the mortals believe. And then he, he comes out with this whole, you know, extended cosmology and even uh, or, or cosmogony, I guess, and theogony and description of, of the way everything works. But ultimately, not, that's not really like the right way. He says this, this is this whole, this whole drawn out, you know, explanation of everything that might even seem like it's right, but that's not true. That's, that's the illusion of mortals. And so, how do we interpret this? This is something that's been, you know, it's been a challenge to interpret for thousands of years. I want to propose my own interpretation of this. And my interpretation of it is that you have to understand a couple things about Parmenides. Let's say first, how does Parmenides present his work? His work is presented in the form of a poem. A poem in the same manner as Homer and Hesiod and the poets, as decried even by Plato, as being the bearers of the mythological truths, okay? The stories of the ancient tradi traditions, the stories of the gods come through the poets. And that's how Parmenides presents his work. It's, a, it's written as a poem. Moreover, it's written in the form of a poem about his visit with a goddess. And all the knowledge that he presents in his poem is knowledge that was given to him from a goddess. So the framework for the entire thing is mythological. And the fact that he's putting it in the form of a poem, it, it means to me that he's familiar with the poets. He listens to the poets. 
right? He's probably memorized the works of the poets. He writes it in a poem. I mean, think about Plato. Plato writes the dialogues. Well, where'd Plato come of age? Plato came up in the world of Socrates. Socrates was a speaker. He would go around and engage in dialogues with people. That's how Socrates worked. So how did Plato write his works? He wrote them in the form of dialogues. Now, Parmenides writes in the form of the poem. What does that tell us? Parmenides probably comes from the world of the poets. And that's how he writes. So he comes from a world of mythological thinking. He describes his poem in mythological terms. And yet we're, we're given this idea that, that Parmenides is, is like the father of this materialistic break from mythology. But I don't think that's accurate. I think that you need to look to Parmenides and understand the mythological context of what he's saying in order to understand the message of Parmenides. So what I would ask is, who is the goddess that provides Parmenides with his information? He goes to visit the goddess. Parmenides says, well, I went to, I went to go, I went to go, you know, to this place beyond the gates of day and night. And I spoke to a goddess and this is what she told me. But he doesn't name the goddess, at least not in the fragments that we have. But we only have fragments. It's not that much. And if you consider that someone like Plato, for example, we have hundreds of pages of material. And Parmenides, I have a couple pages of poetry. But like Homer has, I don't know, hundreds, maybe let's, maybe not hundreds, dozens, maybe hundreds of pages, I guess, of poetry. And we only got a couple pages of Parmenides. There's probably more to it, a lot more to it that we don't have. It's sus suspected and I guess widely acknowledged. There's probably quite a bit more to this. Parmenides is regarded, and it is said by others, I, I, I think it's Plato, so so you know, putting the words in Socrates' mouth, that Parmenides told stories about the gods. That's one of the things we know about. It might have been someone else. I don't re recall where that, but, but the idea was that Parmenides had been a teller of tales about the gods. And we need to acknowledge and take that seriously. And so I had said in a previous episode, in the, in the Heidegger episode... Because he was talking about Parmenides a little bit. Now, Heidegger says that that, that that goddess is Aletheia, which is the goddess of truth or of revealing. Now, Aletheia, revealing, disclosure, uncovering, is fundamental to the project of Martin Heidegger. So I think that Martin Heidegger is going to look at that and say, oh, that looks like Aletheia. And I think everybody's subject to the same sort of thing, but not everybody agrees that it's Althea. It's also been said that it is Persephone. But I would like to propose that the goddess is, in fact, Ananke. The goddess Ananke. He mentioned, Parmenides mentions the goddess Ananke elsewhere in his work and refers to her as the goddess. He doesn't use the name Ananke, but from his description in this other part, it's clear that he's speaking about Ananke, but he just refers to her as the goddess. Now, it's also the case that the information that he gets on the whole, the person who tells him this whole story, is also referred to as the goddess. So right off the bat, we can say if there's two references to the goddess in Parmenides, and one of them is referring clearly to Ananke, we might suspect that the other one is also referring to Ananke. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Ananke. Who is Ananke? What is she all about? And then with that knowledge, we're going to look at Parmenides and we're going to say, is Parmenides talking about Ananke? Is that the goddess? And if Ananke is the goddess, what does that mean for the teaching of Parmenides, the message of Parmenides. Can we reinterpret what Parmenides is saying if we say, okay, Parmenides understands and perhaps he communicated elsewhere somewhere that we haven't, we haven't got any remnants of, um, or maybe it was just understood to an audience that was embedded in this mythological world, uh, that he's talking about Ananke. And what his whole treatise is, perhaps, is in some form, uh, a treatise on 
the nature of an Anke. So that's kind of my project with this episode. Let's do the following. Let's look at uh, Ananke. To start off, let's just go over to Wikipedia. I know Wikipedia is maybe not the greatest source, but this is my doctoral thesis. It's a podcast. So let's just go to Wikipedia and see what they say. Uh, so Wikipedia says the following. In ancient Greek religion, Ananke, from the common noun Ananke, force, constraint, necessity, is the personification of inevitability, compulsion, and necessity. She is customarily depicted as holding a spindle. One of the Greek primordial deities, the births of Ananke and her brother and consort, Kronos, the personification of time, not to be confused with the titan Cronus, were thought to mark the division between the Aeon of Chaos and the beginning of the cosmos. Ananke is considered the most powerful dictator of fate and circumstance. Mortals, as well as gods, respected her power and paid her homage. Sometimes considered the mother of the fates, she is thought to be the only being to influence their decisions, according to some sources, excepting Zeus, also. According to Showalter and Freysen, she and the fates are all sufficiently tied to early Greek mythology to make their Greek origins likely. Uh, let's see. So what else do I see about... That's that's the main thing. What do we, just, and that's just the introduction from Wikipedia. So what do we see here? Okay. Force, constraint, necessity is are the three words used to describe the meaning of the noun Ananke. So Ananke is the name of the goddess and also is simply the word. Necessity, force, Compulsion. Those are the three words used. So those are three three interesting words. Necessity. That's not necessarily in the way that I might say, man, I really need a back rub right now. Uh, need. To need something. What they mean by necessity is a little different than what we might think of necessity as being associated with needing something. It's compulsion. It's all the other two words are force and constraint. Force and constraint, and also the personification of inevitability, compulsion, and necessity. So we've got a couple of words here: force, constraint, inevitability, compulsion. So she's the goddess of these things. She's the mother of the fates. Fate. She's one of the first gods. Um, one of the Greek primordial deities, one of the very first gods. And you might say, if you were a modernist and you were coming back and looking at ancient Greek mythology, you might say that Ananke could be seen as the goddess of determinism. Because if you're looking at fate and you're saying fate and necessity and fate. If you say necessity and fate are sort of bound up together, okay? Necessity is the mother of the fates. Necessity is the is the is more primordial than the fates. Is prior to the fates, okay? That's kind of what motherhood and parenthood might mean in this mythological sense. Is metaphysically prior necessity, or it's it's let's just say it's bound up together. And if you say that. Ananke is one of, or even perhaps the first goddess, or maybe one of the first two bound up with time, time and fate, being I suppose that there can't you there can be no fate without time, so fate can't be prior to time, but time can't be prior to fate and and but what is what is fate? Fate is like Fate and necessity and compulsion and inevitability is is the sense that all things are set in stone from the beginning to the end. That if Ananke must be, in some sense, outside of time. So if Ananke is like outside of time, maybe present at the beginning of time. Let's say Ananke is the, one of the first goddesses present at the beginning of time and able in that moment to know everything that is going to happen. 
because Anangi is is the goddess of fate, and fate is prior to all things, all the future bound by fate. Constrained. Okay, the words we've got here. Force, constraint, inevitability, compulsion, and necessity. Okay. And we see Ananki with a spindle. This One of the symbols of Ananki is the spindle. Uh, now, I want to jump here to Plato for a minute. Plato talks a little bit about Ananki. Uh, in the Republic. Now, uh, this is a... Let's see. How much of this am I going to read? Uh, well, this is a part of... Um, the end of... The end of the Republic. He's telling the myth... of Ur. The myth of Ur is essentially this guy Ur dies, sees some stuff, and then comes back to life and describes what he's seen. More or less... That's the myth of her. So it's a glimpse into the world after death. And uh, this, is, this is what he says. He says, quote, When the spirits which were in the meadow had tarried seven days, on the eighth they were obliged to proceed on their journey. And on the fourth day after, he said that they came to a place where they could see from above a line of light straight as a column, extending right through the whole heaven and through the earth, in color resembling the rainbow, only brighter and purer. Another day's journey brought them to the place, and there, in the midst of the light, they saw the ends of the chains of heaven let down from above. For this light is the belt of heaven and holds together the circle of the universe, like the undergirders of a trireme. From these ends is extended the spindle of necessity, on which all the revolutions turn. The shaft and hook of the spindle are made of steel, and the whorl is made partly of steel and also partly of other materials. Now the whorl is in form like the whorl used on earth, and the description of it implied that there is one large hollow whorl which is quite scooped out, and into this is fitted another lesser one, and another, and another, and four others, making eight in all, like vessels which fit into one another. The whorls show their edges on the upper side, and on their lower side altogether form one continuous whorl. This is pierced by the spindle, which is driven home through the center of the eighth. End quote. Okay, so we've got a basic description of the shape of things, the shape of something. Okay, this is largely acknowledged as the shape of the cosmos. Um, but I, I do want to point out that this is a vision that is seen not at the center of the universe or anything, but after Ur dies. This is what he sees in sort of the spirit world. Okay, that's, an, I think, an important point. Um, although of elsewhere, it's described as being the nature of things, right? The nature of the shape of the galaxy or the shape of the cosmos or the shape of the world is this sort of... So what is, what is this? It's like a, 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 a line with these whorls around it. Um, he basically describes like a vessel within a vessel within it. So picture a large bowl, shallow. And then another smaller bowl inside that. And another one inside that. And another one inside that. Okay, he says there's eight of them. Now, piercing the center, there's this line. Okay, so imagine there's like a steel pole that goes through the center of the middle bowl and extends, let's say, who knows how far in either direction. And there's chains, steel chains that come from this pole and connect to these bowls, which are like the whorls, which are these you know, kind of flat, broad things that revolve around this axis, which is the steel pole, okay? This is sort of shape of things. That's how the universe works. Now, this central steel axis is associated with necessity, or ananke. The symbol of ananke is the spindle, and that's what we're seeing here, the spindle of ananke. The 
central pole and the whorls wrapped around it like a top that could spin. And these and the movements of the central pole or or like the, the direction of the central pole causes the movements of all of the other parts. Okay? In this sense, you might even say that Ananke, as the as the personification of the central axis of necessity, is Aristotle's unmoved mover. But that's a that's a an examination for another day. Um, I just wanted you to have that premise of what Ananke is. Okay, so we've looked at Wikipedia and we looked at Plato, and we got some idea of what Ananke is and represents. Now. If I jump to Parmenides, the poem of Parmenides, he mentions uh, he mentions in here. Let me get to the right spot. So Parmenides says, and this is what is being told to Parmenides by the unnamed goddess, and then he's relating to us. Now, she, she's describing to Parmenides the third of these ways of understanding, which is the way of mortals, the path of mortals. And so here is described all this, this grand cosmology. So in this section, he says, quote, this is Parmenides, says, quote, You shall know the nature of the aether, and all the signs in the aether, and the destructive deeds of the shining sun's pure torch, and whence they came to be, and you shall learn the wandering deeds of the round-faced moon and its nature, and you shall know also the surrounding heaven, from what it grew, and how necessity led and shackled it to hold the limits of the stars. How earth and sun and moon and the aether that is common to all, and the Milky Way, and furthest Olympus and the hot force of the stars surged forth to come to be. For the narrower wreaths were filled with unmixed fire, and the ones next to them with night. But a due amount of fire is inserted among it, and in the middle of these is the goddess who governs all things. For she rules over hateful birth and union of all things, sending the female to unite with male, and in opposite faction, male to female. First of all gods, she contrived love. End quote. So... Those are a couple different fragments. We don't necessarily like, you know, know or even maybe suspect that they went in order quite like that. There's a few breaks there, so there may have been may have been something else inserted between those, but what we're essentially looking at is uh he says necessity led and shackled it to hold the limits of the stars. He's talking about necessity. Uh He's talking about the narrower wreaths filled with unmixed fire, the ones next to them with night, a due amount of fire inserted among it. In the middle of these, in, so in the middle of these wreaths, so wreaths are these round, these round bands. Okay, these are described in the term in the term of bands at times from other philosophers. This isn't just like a new idea. This there's these concentric rings, more so than concentric spheres. We see concentric rings and an axis in the middle of the concentric rings. We see this a lot. Okay, for, for the narrower wreaths were filled with unmixed fire, the ones next to them with night, a due amount of fire inserted among it. In the middle of these is the goddess who governs all things, for she rules over hateful birth and union of all things, sending the female to unite with male in an opposite faction, male to female. First of all, the gods she contrived love. So this is what we're seeing is a nonke necessity ruling over all things. The first of the gods that a nonke creates is love. A nonke rules over the hate rules over hateful birth and union of all things. So a nonke rules over things. Hateful is a weird word to to use to describe that, but I don't I don't know. It's the union of the union of things, and also we see in Heraclitus the strife, and we actually see in Empedocles, who comes after Parmenides, this idea of love and strife are these two primordial forces. So I want you to imagine, for a minute, a vision in which Ananke is the first, and then Ananke creates love, 
and strife. And so it's like a triangle, if you will, Ananke being the most primordial, and then love and strife, union and separation, coming to be and passing away, coming together and breaking apart as these sort of lower level gods created after Ananke. I think that is somewhat in line with the vision that we see in this and elsewhere, like we saw in Heraclitus, a sort of structure and law hidden behind the continuous fluctuations of change. The coming to be and passing away of things, the fire, the river that can never be stepped in twice, this constant world of change, and underneath that, he just hints at a sort of world of necessity. And, he, and Ananke, a necessity, is, I even mentioned the word, I believe, in the episode on Heraclitus. He, Heraclitus mentions that or has been rumored to have had statements about the, law, the underlying laws that govern the change that's perpetual. Um, let us call that Ananke. So we have Ananke, and then we have love and strife so there's a sort of vision of vision of the world okay now when he talks about the goddess he's so he, he calls ananke the goddess in that passage i read he says the goddess that rules over all these things in the center he's talking about ananke then he also has the goddess who speaks to him and my proposal is that that goddess is ananke also and so he's in order to get there he has to travel he has to pass beyond the gates of day and night what does that mean pass he, he went through the gates of day and night and that was how he got to ananke well he you might say he transcended the world of opposites he transcended the dichotomy of day and night he also you might say transcended time the gates of day and night might represent the passage of time day and night, the repetitious cycle of time. Passing through the gates of day and night, he travels past the world of opposites, he travels outside of time, he enters the domain of the goddess. It seems to me that if he's outside of the world of opposites and he's outside of time, he's at a, in a most primordial space and he's getting a new sort of truth that might even be counterintuitive because we and Parmenides prior to making this trip are bound in the world of time, the cycle of opposites and everything else. Okay. The world of coming to be and passing away. And so we can't see things from the perspective of Ananke. So my proposal would be that Parmenides is giving us the world from the perspective of Ananke. Now let me jump in and read a little bit here back to John Burnett. Okay, now that I've deviated a little bit to Wikipedia and Plato, I'm coming back to John Burnett here when he talks about Parmenides. Um, he says, quote, In the first part of his poem, we find Parmenides chiefly interested to prove that it is. But it is not quite obvious at first sight precisely what it is that is. He says simply, what is, is. There can be no real doubt that this is what we call body. It is certainly regarded as spatially extended, for it is quite seriously spoken of as a sphere. Moreover, Aristotle tells us that Parmenides believed in none but a sensible reality. Parmenides does not say a word about being anywhere, and it is remarkable that he avoids the term God, which was so freely used by earlier and later thinkers. Okay, I have to stop this. I have to stop before I finish reading this section. It's remarkable that this author can say that Parmenides avoids the term God. Parmenides uses the term goddess multiple times. In fact, it's fundamental to what Parmenides is saying. The whole thing is in poem form, in the form of a message given to him by the goddess. 
It's like fundamental to what Parmenides is saying. And so this, I think, is a clear demonstration of the sort of biases that you get from particularly Christian uh, scholars who are looking at this and want to take the same sort of view that we saw in Ben Shapiro's book, where we get uh, reason and rationality from the ancient Greeks, and then we get our spiritual beliefs and religion from the ancient Israelites. And in order to have that view of things, you have to strip the religion off of the philosophy and just take this core nugget of reason and rationality and carry that along, right? And so it's seen through these these like lenses that when I look at it, I think there's no way that you can really have said that Parmenides avoids the term God. Okay, maybe, but only in the, first of all, only in the fragments we have, which we have no idea if that constitutes a large or small part, but I suspect it constitutes a fairly small part of the output of Parmenides. Anyway, jumping back in here, he says, quote, the assertion that it is amounts to just this, that the universe is a plenum and that there is no such thing as empty space, either inside or outside the world. From this, it follows that there can be no such thing as motion. Instead of endowing the one with an impulse to change, as Heraclitus had done, and thus making it capable of explaining the world, Parmenides dismissed change as an illusion. He showed once for all that if you take the one seriously, you are bound to deny everything else. All previous solutions of the question, therefore, had missed the point. Anaximenes, who thought to save the unity of the primary substance by his theory of rarefaction and condensation, did not observe that by assuming there was less of what was in one place than another, he virtually affirmed the existence of what is not. The Pythagorean explanation implied that empty space or air existed outside the world and that it entered into it to separate the units. It, too, assumed the existence of what is not. Nor is the theory of Heraclitus any more satisfactory, for it is based on the conclusion, uh, it is based on the contradiction that fire both is and is not. End quote. We're looking at here the basics of Parmenides of like that which is, is, and that which is not, is not. Okay, there can be no nothing. There can that which is not can't be spoken of, can't be thought of. It doesn't exist. Non-existence doesn't exist. Only existence exists, and that is the core premise of Parmenides. What do we? How do we get that? Really, I mean, I don't know if I want to dip too much into the poem itself, but. Um, Let's see if I can pull a few spots out. So Parmenides is saying this from the words of the goddess. He says, quote, Come now, I will tell you, and you, when you have heard the story, bring it away, about those roots of investigation that are the only ones to be thought of. The one, both that is, and that it is not the case that it is not, is the path of persuasion, for it accompanies truth. The other, both that it is not and that is not is right, this indeed I declare to you to be a track entirely unable to be investigated. For you cannot know what is not, for it cannot be accomplished, nor can you declare it. End quote. So he says there's two paths. Path of what is and the path of what is not. And the path of what is not is entirely unable to be investigated. You cannot know it, nor can you declare it. Now, if we imagine that this is coming from the words of Anaki and coming from the goddess of fate and coming from a space outside of space and time, and if we were to look at this in a sort of modern perspective as deterministic, I mean, you must you must say that in a world that is absolutely and 100% ruled over by Ananke, and if Ananke is powerful and primordial enough to even command the gods or be, you know, reign over the gods or rule over the gods or be, you know, unable to be resisted by the gods, which is what we saw in that Wikipedia. If Ananki is so powerful and and is at the center of everything and guiding everything, isn't that a sort of deterministic world? And if you were to step outside of time, as the goddess of fate must do, 
and you were to look at all of the material things and the way they arrange and the way everything is set to move uh, in accordance with a certain specific plan from beginning to end, all things known in advance. I mean, isn't that itself an extremely deterministic view of the world? So isn't, couldn't you, and, and you know, these ancient Greek philosophers, and, you know, you can see this in the Stoics as well, but they did have the concept of, you know, you're unable to escape your fate. You, you, no matter what you do, you don't really have the choice to do what you want to do. You're bound up by fate. I mean, we see in a lot of Greek tragedy the various curses and fates to certain, that certain people have given to them by the gods. And these curses and fates and prophecies and stuff really always seem to track back to Ananke. Many of the, of the prof, most profound prophecies of, uh, of Greek mythology can ultimately, ultimately be tracked back to Ananke. But Ananke, you know, the, as the goddess of fate, must have a, a hand in all prophecies, right? Uh, she must, by, by default, sort of be the goddess of prophecy, in a way. Um, now, seen from that perspective, you might be able to look at this and say, okay, well, well, don't you in that case have a path, have not only the path of what is and the path of what is not, but you might, ha you might have the path of what is, what was, and what will be, and the path of what is not. You might have the path of that which must be, that which must occur, that which is fated to occur, and the path of that which is not fated to occur. All of those avenues and possibilities of things unfolding in ways that they're not fated to unfold can never be in a deterministic world. In the world in which Ananke reigns supreme, there is that which must be and that which must not be. And that's the only two ways of seeing things. There's, there's everything. There's the... So, in a sense... If, if all things are connected in this causal way, you almost, they almost blend into one another in the sense that you sort of lose the, a multiplicity of events. This thing happens and that thing happens and the other thing happens and there's this and that and the other thing and all these connected parts. Seen from a real God's eye view, you might just call the whole cosmos like the event. An, an event with a multitude of sub-events. So there's the event, and then there's the non-event, the things that don't happen. And those are the two paths, the path of what is and the path of what is not, the path of that which must occur, which you are always on, which you cannot deviate from, you cannot step foot off of the path of what is. You can't ever escape what is. You're, you're on the path of that which is. You will never step, step foot on the path of what is not. You won't even be able to conceive of it or think of it. Because your thoughts are still bound within that which is. Okay? Then, that is the God's eye view. Most people can't see things in that, in that way. They see a world of choice. They see a world of the present moment being excluded from the past and future. We can't really access the past and past and future in a world of things, in a world of a multiplicity of events and the, the, the depth of connection from one event to the other, the multitude of events that occur, which seem unrelated to us, but are related in a hidden, in a hidden way. That's the third thing she describes, the way of mortals. By me, by the way of mortals, she means the way of beings that cannot see things from the God's eye view. Things that cannot escape time. Those beings that are not beyond the doors of day and night. Okay? The beings that are bound by time. The mortals. They view things in this certain way. And that way is all of the things of multiplicity of things of this, that, and the other and the process of time and everything else. And it's real, but it's also an illusion. It's real, but it's also not entirely real because it's not viewing things from the absolute pinnacle perspective. So that's my proposal, essentially, of who, who the goddess is and what she's saying and how that fits in. And I think that 
many scholars are looking at Ananke, or I'm sorry, looking at Parmenides and banging their head against a wall because I don't think they understand the role that Ananke and fate play in this and the extent to which this is not entirely just this, you know, materialistic scientific doctrine of, of you know, escape from mythology like we might want to try to present it as the birth of science. But this is a fundamentally religious document of the the way the world appears from the perspective of Ananke. And it's a statement about Ananke's priority in the world. And, you know, there's different religious threads in the Greek world. And there's, you know, there's like an Orphic worldview, which has a more important role for Ananke to play. There's a Pythagorean worldview and a Pythagorean view of the gods as well. The gods play a role in that. Um, I think that this is more of a religious document than people are willing to admit. So let me move on. I want to read another section here. This is, this is just when he's talking about the second part of the poem. He says, we must, he says, quote, we must now look at the general cosmical view expounded in the second part of the poem. The fragments are scanty and the doxographical tradition hard to interpret, but enough remains to show that here too we are on Pythagorean ground. Adios says, Parmenides held that there were bands crossing one another and encircling one another, formed of the rare and the dense element respectively, and that between these there were other mixed bands made up of light and darkness. That which surrounds them was all solid like a wall, and under it is a fiery band. That which is in the middle of all these bands is also solid and surrounded in turn by a fiery band. The central circle of the mixed bands is the cause of movement and becoming to all the rest. He calls it the goddess who directs their course, the holder of lots, and necessity. Now, it is quite unjustifiable to regard these bands as spheres. The word can mean rims or brims or anything of that sort, but it seems incredible that it should be used of spheres. It does not appear either that the solid circle which surrounds all the crowns is to be regarded as spherical. The expression like a wall would be highly inappropriate in that case. We seem then to be face to face with something like the wheels of an Aximander, and it is highly probable that Pythagoras adopted the theory from him. Nor is evidence lacking that the Pythagoreans did regard the heavenly bodies in this way. In Plato's myth of Ur, which is certainly Pythagorean in its general character, we do not hear of spheres but of the lips of concentric whorls fitted into one another like a nest of boxes. In the Timaeus, there are no spheres either, but bands or strips crossing each other at an angle. End quote. Okay, so that's just like the general, you know, kind of reaffirming the war, the shape of the world that he's describing and the, you know, the mention again of necessity guiding all things at the center of, of this. Uh, so then jumping in here uh, again, quote, he says, In the middle of those, says Parmenides, is the goddess who steers the course of all things. Adios explains this to mean in the middle of the mixed bands, while Simplicius declares that it means in the middle of all the bands, that is to say, in the center of the world. It is not likely that either of them had anything better to go upon than the words of Parmenides himself, and these are ambiguous. Simplicius is as clear from the language he uses, identified this goddess with the Pythagorean Hestia, or central fire. While Theophrastus could not do that because he knew and stated that Parmenides described the earth as round and in the center of the world. In this very passage, we are told that what is in the middle of all these bands is solid. The data furnished by Theophrastus, in fact, exclude the identification of the goddess with the central fire altogether. We cannot say that what is in the middle of all the bands is solid and that under it there is again a fiery band nor does it seem fitting to relegate a goddess to the middle of a solid spherical earth. End quote. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure where he's getting some of this from. Um, he, he seems to say that there's a... You know, he's looking to it a couple other thinkers, Theophrastus, Adios, Simplicius. I don't have their materials on hand, uh, but he, he talks about a spherical world in the center of 
of the band. I don't, I don't really see that. I haven't seen that anywhere. It's, and it, what he says, let's see what he says. Uh, Theophrastus could not do that because he knew and stated that Parmenides described the earth as round and in the center of the world. Uh, we don't have that fragment of Parmenides saying that the earth is a sphere and it's in the center of the universe. And, uh, but we do, we do get the, this idea of the axis in the center of the universe. But this also comes down to where we have to sort of separate the idea that the myth of Ur and the description therein is a description of the spirit world. And that's something that he saw when he died. And so um, it might be the case both that the earth is a sphere in the center of the world, that, that Parmenides may have said that, um, but it also may be the case that, I, I don't know, I don't know. It's hard to interpret that. Well, yeah, he says, necessity led and shackled it to hold the limit of the stars. But then he says, um, he says, the narrower wreaths were filled with unmixed fire, the ones next to them with night, a due amount of fire inserted among it. He says, the middle of the, in the middle of these is the goddess who governs all things. But he's talking about the wreaths, he's talking about the bands, he's talking about the concentric circles, the goddess in the center of those circles, guiding all things. Necessity led and shackled all things. We see the steel axis in Plato at the center of all things, guiding all things, chained to all things, constraining all things. It makes sense that this that he's speaking about the same goddess slash axis. I don't see how the spherical world in the in the middle of these bands. I mean, it might, that might be the case, but then you might ha say, well, a sphere also can revolve around an axis. That's what our planet does. And so it might not be the case that a, the sphere and the axis are really, uh, uh, or the planet Earth, the spherical Earth and the axis are contradictory. That may not be the case at all. And Plato seems to say that, the, that this spindle pole comes straight up out of the ground into the up to the heavens so in that sense it, it pierces right through the earth as well so um anyhow let's let's move along um so immediately after that last section he says quote we are further told by adios that this goddess was called ananke and the holder of lots we already know that she steers the course of all things, that is, that she regulates the motions of these celestial bands. Simplicius adds, unfortunately, without quoting the actual words, that she sends souls at one time from the light to the unseen world, and at another time from the unseen world to the light. It would be difficult to describe more exactly what the goddess does in the myth of Ur. And so here, once more, we seem to be on Pythagorean ground. It is to be noticed further that in fragment 10, we read how Ananke took the heavens and compelled them to hold fast the fixed course of the stars. And that in fragment 12, we are told that she is the beginner of all pairings and birth. Lastly, in fragment 13, we hear that she created Eros, first of all the gods. So we shall find that in Empedocles, it is an ancient oracle or decree of Ananke that causes the gods to fall and become incarnate in a cycle of births, end quote. So I'm just, uh, I'm going to continue on, but just pointing out, this is exactly the same thing that I was just saying. Um, we, we see a few things about Ananke at the center of all things, holding fast all things, the beginning of all pairings and all birth, creating Eros or love first of all the gods, the same goddess as in the myth of Ur, how these things, he's acknowledging this stuff all, sounds like it all fits together. It's just the one last jump to say that the the goddess that's providing Parmenides with the whole story is in fact Ananke, is the leap that I'm making that this author doesn't make and I don't I haven't seen any author make that that leap. So if there's an author out there or a thinker out there who's made that claim, um I would love to know about it. Okay, so moving right on, he says, quote, We should be more certain 
of the place this goddess occupies in the universe, if we could be sure where Ananke is in the myth of Ur. Without, however, raising that vexed question, we may lay down with some confidence that according to Theophrastus, she occupied a position midway between the earth and the heavens. Whether we believe in the mixed bands or not makes no difference in this respect, for the statement of Adios says that she was in the middle of the mixed bands undoubtedly implies that she was between earth and heaven. Now she is identified with one of the bands in a somewhat confused passage of Cicero, and the whole theory of wheels or bands was probably suggested by the Milky Way. It seems to me, therefore, that we must think of the Milky Way as a band intermediate between those of the sun and the moon, and this agrees very well with the prominent way in which it is mentioned in fragment 11. It is better not to be too positive about the other details, though it is interesting to notice that according to some it was Pythagoras, according to others, Parmenides, who discovered the identity of the evening and morning star. End quote. So uh, I'll go on, but in this paragraph, I just want to point out how um, he says he says uh, we should be more so we could be more certain of the, of the place of the goddess occupies in the universe if we could be sure where Ananke is in the myth of Ur. And he says that I think because uh, Ananke being identified with the central axis in the myth of Ur is in a place where Ur goes after he dies so it's not even a place in the world so you, you're I mean, unless he's traveling to the center of the universe after he dies we can't really rule that out i suppose um and i guess the greeks didn't really have a profound sense of another world uh, but you know i think that also might be a little bit of a biased understanding of ancient greece as well anyway let me keep moving on here to the next paragraph he says besides all this he says quote besides all this it is certain that Parmenides went on to describe how the other gods were born and how they fell an idea which we know to be Orphic and which may well have been Pythagorean we shall come to it again in Empedocles in Plato's symposium Agathon couples Parmenides with Hesiod as a narrator of ancient deeds of violence committed by the gods if Parmenides was expounding the Pythagorean theology, this is just what we should expect, but it seems hopeless to explain it on any of the other theories which have been advanced on the purpose of the way of belief. Such things belong to theological speculation and not to the beliefs of the many. Still less can we think it probable that Parmenides made up these stories himself to show what the popular view of the world really implied if properly formulated. We must ask, I think, that any theory shall account for what was evidently no inconsiderable part of the poem. End quote. So what he's saying here is that uh, it's generally understood that there's much more to this in which he goes on and talks about the ancient deeds of the gods. He says in Plato's Symposium, Agathon couples Parmenides with Hesiod, who was an ancient poet who wrote the Theogony, who wrote much about ancient mythology, he says he couples Parmenides with Hesiod as a narrator of ancient deeds of violence committed by the gods. So we know that, that Parmenides wrote more and he wrote about the gods. And we also know that this author, John Burnett, uh, is really tying the ideas of Parmenides with Pythagorean theology and Pythagorean ideas and also with Orphic ideas. So... Then, uh, what else did I want? I think I only really had one more section that I wanted to read. Uh, so just, yeah, this will be the last thing I read. And this is just kind of summing up what his, again, what his basic thesis was, which seems to me to have a real fundamental logical hole in it. He says, quote, The belief that all things are one was common to the early Ionians, but now Parmenides has shown that, if this one thing really is, we must give up the idea that it can take different forms. The senses which present to us a world of change and multiplicity are deceitful. There seemed to be no escape from his arguments, and so we find that from this time onwards, all the thinkers, in whose hands philosophy made progress, abandoned the monistic hypothesis. Those who still held by it adopted a critical attitude and confined themselves to a defense 
of the theory of Parmenides against the new views. Others taught the doctrine of Heraclitus in an exaggerated form. Some continued to expound the systems of the early Milesians, but the leading men all are pluralists. The corporealist hypothesis had proved unable to bear the weight of a monistic structure. End quote. Okay, so he's, re he's reasserting his thesis, and I think that's the spot, you know, outside of the preface, where he most clearly states it. Again, doesn't entirely make sense to me that he's saying that Parmenides spoke up on the corporeal monism, explained the corporeal monism, and that all the leading thinkers afterwards were pluralists because they had to abandon the monism because the arguments of Parmenides were simply untenable. He doesn't say that following after that, corporeal monism took over philosophy. He says that after that, people, the main thinkers, had to reject monism because corporealism couldn't bear the weight of monism. And so he's saying that Parmenides put forward an idea that had to be struck down on account of its untenability, on account of its unworkableness. And I'm not sure that I think that's true. I don't think that was Parmenides' intention. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting perspective, let's say that. And I think that there's probably something to it in some sense as well, because I think that the views of Parmenides can be really unsettling and maybe counterintuitive. And I've stated previously that in a sort of dispute between Heraclitus and Parmenides, if you say Heraclitus is the pluralist and Parmenides is the monist, then I would fall more on the side of Heraclitus, that I do live in a world of many things, and those many things are coming and going, and coming to be and passing away, and everything is changing. And at the same time, I have to say that if you were to step outside of time, if you were to look at the universe as a whole, and you were to say that everything was absolutely deterministic, then everything would already be sort of set in stone from the get-go. And then in that sort of a perspective, especially from one in which you're step stepping outside of the constraints of the present moment and looking at the whole thing as a whole, which you must do in order to understand determinism, then that whole event, if you will, is unchangeable. That's, what, that's the whole nature of it. It's unchangeable. And in that sense, there is no change because there's no deviation from the plan. So in that sense, there's sort of monism to that deterministic perspective. But we would, will never be able to pass through the gates of day and night. So we'll always be bound in the world of things. The world of things is and the world of change, and the world of uncertainty is for us a permanent view. Should we regard it as a permanent illusion? I would say no. It's not an illusion. It's just that we can't see everything. There is a part of the world that's always concealed from us. We'll never have access to the complete view. All right, so that will wrap up today's episode. Thanks for listening. See you next time.